I'm Daniel Casrail from New York. I'm the co-founder and medical psychiatric superintendent of Daytop Village. From my five years' experience, it is my opinion that drug addicts are curable. I'm Dr. Jerome H. Jaffe of the University of Chicago's Department of Psychiatry and the Department of Mental Health of the state of Illinois. I believe that narcotics users are a heterogeneous group and that there is no one treatment approach that is appropriate to all of them. I'm Dr. Francis Gearing from the Division of Epidemiology of the School of Public Health at Columbia University. I'm involved in developing evaluation criteria to measure success of narcotics treatment programs so that their results may be compared. Welcome to the exploration of concepts and controversies in modern medicine. One of a series of programs dedicated to examining the uncertain, candidly recognizing that much of today's teaching is necessarily based upon opinion, and that the opinions of eminent physicians in a given field vary widely. The National Medical Audiovisual Center believes that openly airing such opposing views is a basic responsibility of medical communications. Dr. Francis Gearing, Assistant Professor of Epidemiology at Columbia University School of Public Health and Administrative Medicine, will act as moderator of this presentation. We have two approaches to the problem of the treatment of narcotics addicts, both of which have their proponents and opponents. Dr. Casro, what is Daytop Village and why do you think it works? Daytop Village is a halfway house, better still, a therapeutic community. Uh, it is a nonprofit corporation, basically subsidized by the state of New York, also uh, having its own uh, funds uh, available through its own resources. It is basically a collection of people, black, white, Puerto Rican, young and old, uh, with and without their children. They all have one thing in common. They've all been uh, hardcore addicts and addicted to heroin. They, have all, they all have one goal in common, and that is to help each other and themselves, cure themselves and rid themselves of the problem and the symptom of drug addiction. In my experience, I find that what has happened in Daytop, through the amalgamation of the hostile confrontations uh, developed by places like Synanon and the supportive emotional understanding approach that has been classically used by psychiatrists. There has evolved in Daytop a new dynamic which is extremely effective and is very exciting because it leads not only to the solution to the problem of drug addiction but in my opinion, leads to the solution of the problem of the character disorder in general. Dr. Jaffe, what is the approach to narcotic, treatment of narcotics addicts in, in the state of Illinois? Well, a little over a year ago, uh, we had no treatment facilities for narcotics users in the state. And our task was to develop treatment programs. In doing so, we decided to uh, look around at the various programs being proposed throughout the country, ranging from civil commitment programs in California to methadone maintenance in New York uh, and uh, programs such as Synanon and Daytop Village. Uh, we felt that the claims of all of these programs were worthy of exploration, and we have evolved a program uh, which establishes all of these treatment programs in a context which permits us to compare each to the other, so that we can develop a program which is best suited to the needs of the community, uh, in, namely the, the uh, urban area around Chicago. Uh, doctor, I think in answer to your second question, why does it work, or how does it work, I think to explain it, I've had to change some of the psychodynamic theory. 
Most theories state that people react to stress by flight and fight, fear and anger. To really account what happens in Daytop, we've had to hypothesize a third way of reaction, and that's by withdrawal and encapsulation. Now, the encapsulating shell that a person utilizes may be heroin or it may be other, some, uh, some other characterological shell, such as homosexuality or the shell of inadequacy or the shell of criminality, etc. Uh, but if you take this as a hypothesis, then the treatment to the character disorder in general and the treatment of the drug addict in particular becomes very uh, understandable and very obvious. Uh, in Daytop, there are two cardinal rules. No chemicals of any kind, of course, and no physical violence, of course. Now, when we say no chemicals, there are no other shells under which to hide. Once we remove the shell of the chemical, we prevent the individual from running into other types of encapsulating shells where they cannot or will not communicate with significant others. Uh, so that the individual in Daytop can only react to stress or danger in one way, and that's through anxiety. He can't fight in anger, and he can't withdraw into isolation. He has only one method of coping with stress, and that's through fear. Now, with fear, he can either run out of the house, never to return, or sometimes very frequently to return, or he can stay to fight his fear, to resolve his fear. If he stays, the problem is basically a re-educational one not only emotionally, but also behaviorally and attitudinally, vocationally, educationally, morally, ethically, culturally. We have to re-educate this rather primitive uh, antisocial human being into a culturally uh, uh, acceptable uh, adult. And this is what we're able to do in about a year and a half currently. I hope to improve the process so that we'll be able to reduce this time in the future to about a year. You're, Im you're implying then that uh, a, a treatment modality that, that has a drug maintenance in it is not a treatment modality. Would uh, you like to discuss that, Dr. Jaffe? Well, uh, I'm not sure that's what Dr. Caswell is implying. I you think see, he said that. no chemicals to hide behind. Well, that's obviously one approach. Uh, I wonder whether chemicals are always hiding, uh, because I think that there are two issues here, one of which is Dr. Casriel, uh, Dr. Casriel's inference about what is the nature of uh, narcotics addiction, and what you're saying is narcotics addiction is basically a, a withdrawal behind a chemical as a response to stress. That's right. And uh, other people have made other inferences from other approaches. For example, Dole and Nyswander have proposed, based on their observations of what happens when they treat people with high doses of methadone each day, that in fact uh, the narcotics user isn't, isn't withdrawing, that he is responding to some metabolic difficulty, uh, uh, specifically a kind of a narcotics hunger, which has been induced by the repeated use of narcotics. So now when he stops using narcotics, he never feels normal again. He has this persistent hunger. At least it persists for many, many months beyond the time that he's used narcotics. So they make the inference that, in fact, this is not a withdrawal, but this is a response to a metabolic difficulty. Correct that, specifically with the use of a drug like methadone, and many of these individuals require no further treatment. Obviously, some will need social and vocational rehabilitation and characterological change. Uh, they'll need to be re-socialized. But that is uh, something that uh, would happen to any delinquent, not specific to the narcotics user. Uh, I don't think the hunger is metabolic. I, I see no difference between the hunger of an addict, which lasts for months after he stopped the physiological addiction, and the hunger of a homosexual, who uh, is now developing a heterosexual way of life. Every time a homosexual gets anxious, he feels homosexual and he seeks a homosexual outlet. Every time a drug addict in the process of getting well gets anxious, he seeks the heroin to resolve his anxiety. I think there are alternative interpretations other than a metabolic disorder. One could talk about a, a, an overlearning, a conditioning process, such that what has to, uh, so the narcotics user doesn't, doesn't have an actual hunger, but is conditioned to make a drug-using response in preference to any other kind of response to handle the internal difficulties and the process required to cure this 
is, number one, a, uh, a re-educational one or a, an ex a process of extinction. What I am trying to say is that it's one thing to talk about the inference from the data about the nature of the disease. It's another to talk about uh, what is the outcome of certain therapeutic operations. I would say that uh, one has to seriously consider their data. They have, of course, treated uh, almost a thousand people with large daily doses of methadone. They say that the, about 750 are successfully treated, meaning that they are working, that they have a very low rearrest rate, a very low rate of relapse to narcotics use, and that although about uh, 10 to 15% of them are using alcohol or amphetamines, that still leaves them with a very, very respectable percentage of individuals who are making satisfactory social adjustments. Uh, and given that kind of data, and given the small number of graduates of therapeutic communities to date, from the social point of view or the public health point of view, it's of real uh, significance as to whether or not we go along with what will help solve the social problem of narcotics use and what should we do about our inference about the cause of narcotics use. Uh, I think, I think as uh, the social problem that narcotic uh, users cause, uh, there's no question that methadone can uh, alleviate a great deal of the crime uh, immediately because uh, it's true, once they're on methadone, there's no desire for heroin. They're just uh, overwhelmed with the methadone. Uh, but, uh, and I have no uh, complaint about a 10 or 15% failure rate. We have about a 10% failure rate now with our graduates. Uh, so that is in keeping, I think, with, uh, I'm perfectly happy with that. Uh, what I question is their uh, statement of the level of social and uh, vocational integration and emotional integration while being sustained on methadone. Uh, how many of those 85% uh, are truly functioning in a capacity that they would otherwise function in if they weren't uh, narcotic addicts and on methadone? Well, I think that what we have to look at is what percentage of people in a therapeutic community would be truly functioning at a high level if they weren't in a therapeutic community. Now, if you then compare your graduates and uh, the overall percentage of people entering a therapeutic community uh, and the, the percent graduates and say, now, how are the graduates doing? That might be a reasonably fair comparison. Well, and the real question here is one of attrition of the hundreds of people who come in to therapeutic communities, and I think it would be unfair to imply that every therapeutic community has the same holding power or the same recovery rate as Daytop Village. There are a number of these, as you well know, and the attrition rate of some is such that of 100 people making initial contact, only 15 actually enter the therapeutic community. So that even if all 15 were to become successful graduates with a zero rate of relapse, you would still have to deal with the fact that somewhere in the community there are 85 people who, for one reason or another, have been unable to benefit from this treatment process. I agree. I think ever, any treatment has to be uh, uh, rated on its effectiveness. Uh, now, I think it's taken data five years to really zero in on the effective process. And I feel that we do have one now. In the last four months, uh, our holding power of all those coming in is 85%, and we're taking in about 100 a month. Uh, I mean, 85% of those who, who apply to you are stay, stay. Stay. They might split, but they come back. Mm -hmm. uh, but is there, is there any, are there are any that, are, that come to you that are rejected by you as not... Uh, 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 very rare. Very rare. Less than 1%, I should say. Is, this is an interesting contrast to our experience thus far in Chicago. Uh, and brings us into uh, the question of compulsory treatment. We have a system in which people are offered an opportunity to enter a therapeutic community. They are told if they will simply go for the interview and are either rejected or decide not to enter, they can come back to the intake center and will be offered another treatment. The, the response to this situation is such that well under half of the people given this opportunity will not even participate in an interview. In other words, they would rather never come back and never have any opportunity for further treatment than to go simply for the interview. Uh, so this, is, this must reflect differences 
in the population. It also reflects differences in the law. Uh, in, in New York now, you know, there's a heavy, heavy hangover. If you get caught as a drug addict, you know, you have to go and uh, you are incarcerated in the state program. I think this is a motivating tool to get the person into detox. Uh, we assume when they come in, they truly have no real motivation. And one of the things we do very early is to motivate them so that if they stay over uh, several weeks, our holding power, again, for the last four months has been 97 some point some percentage. Uh, it's very exciting now what is finally being jailed. Uh, but I agree with you, you have to push the addict into treatment. And you have to assume that he is not motivated when he gets into the treatment modality. Uh, this, is, th th this is, of course, the great paradox that although you have to push them into treatments that uh, we designate as being curative, we have a waiting list of several hundred people who want to participate in a methadone treatment program. Now, when we say methadone treatment program, we don't mean simply substituting methadone for the heroin. As a condition of participating in this program, they do attend groups. They are required to take a look at themselves, unless they can make a case that says, I do not require this because I am working, I have not been arrested, I am not using drugs, in which, and all I require is this medication each day. If somebody can say that, I think the burden is on us to, to say why he should be forced into participating in group therapy. But this, I, I submit, is, is a philosophical uh, position. Uh, um, those people who are not working, those people who are, in fact, still showing some form of drug use, whether it be alcoholism or barbiturate or amphetamine use, uh, or uh, who don't have any legitimate means of support, and we suspect that they're engaged in some kind of antisocial activity, are required to participate in groups uh, just as if they were totally abstinent. And furthermore, some of them who start on methadone do elect, after a period of several months, to be withdrawn from methadone, after which they participate in a totally abstinent program based on a day-top model, or may actually elect, at that point, to enter a therapeutic community. My, my point is that when first confronted, when, you know, with the idea of immediate entrance into a therapeutic community, the number of people who will reject that totally is rather high. I, I'm not uh, pushing for the first and only step uh, to rehabilitate an addict must be a therapeutic community. What I'm objecting to is the use of methadone as a total maintenance dose, you know, for indefinite periods of time. Now, if you want to use methadone to control and contain and try to wean a person into therapy, whether it's a therapeutic community or group therapy, uh, the type that has evolved in Daytop, or similar types of groups, which are effective, uh, fine. I have no objection. You know, I'm not on a witch hunt for methadone any more than I was on a witch hunt for heroin. Uh, but I do feel that these people need to be forced into a treatment process. Uh, and I think it behooves the doctor uh, to force uh, the community to take responsible action, just as the community has taken responsible action for any communicable disease, such as leprosy or uh, all the various uh, communicable diseases. Uh, to me, an addict on the street is a, is a contagion, and he will introduce his contagion, his, his symptom, to his friends. Do you consider a, a human being who was once a heroin user, who now works and takes methadone each day, or some drug similar to methadone? you consider him to be a contagion? I don't think he is the contagion that a heroin addict is because he's now law-abiding and attempting to function. But I think he's a very poor role model for others who could otherwise be completely free of methadone. And I can't truly really buy uh, the concept that a person on methadone is a healthy human being emotionally. I just can't conceive of it. Well. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. We, we, could, we could talk about the relativity of all of these things. Clearly, he is a poor role model for people who have the capacity and the interest and the potential for becoming totally independent of all medical support, as you claim that people who go to Data Village will become. But he's a fine role model walking around the streets to people 
who have not yet made a commitment to give up intravenous heroin. And as a matter of fact, one of the great advantages of methadone, which people have not emphasized sufficiently, is that people who enter a therapeutic community like Daytop Village sort of disappear into the bowels of this organization for a year, never go back to the neighborhoods to tell people there's another way of life. But that's not Whereas true. People on methadone, at least in our program, which requires no hospitalization, are almost transformed immediately into non-drug users and go back and carry the word to the community. But your statement isn't quite com uh, true because uh, one of the things in the rehabilitation of the person at Daytop is to go back into addict communities and by example prove to others who are still using drugs that you don't have to be a dope fiend anymore. And uh, we have three storefronts right now in high density uh, uh, addictive uh, areas where we are sucking, literally vacuuming the streets of the attic by confrontation. Uh, many of these boys used to shoot dope with these kids that are still on the street. And uh, they say, look, Johnny, you don't have to do it anymore. You know, you don't have to be a dope fiend. It isn't metabolic, you know. You're not some peculiar, enzymatic, defunct human being. You've just had a problem that you've never been able to face. And that problem is emotional, cultural, social, vocational, etc and we'll be able to help you. And it's a very hard... Uh, how, how long after they start at Daytop do they get back into the community? Uh, right now, uh, between 15 and 18 months, and I hope within the next year to cut that down by at least three months or perhaps six months. Well, then, then if Jaffe's statement was correct, for a year they are, they are, they are off the streets, of, uh, uh, they're off the streets, whereas in an ambulatory program they're back on the street almost immediately and even with the and even with the uh, the uh, uh, inpatient induction they're they're out within four weeks but their cultural values their social values their moral values their ethical values none of these have changed well that's um, an assumption uh, one important thing is that but don't tell me it changes within the day no it does do. not change within the day that's quite true the real issue is can can we afford to change that slowly, or can it be changed slowly, as uh, an ongoing process after they've started methadone, or is it necessary to make a total break with the uh, drug-using subculture and to live in a therapeutic community for a while? I submit that this is a question for further research. Uh, I have seen people switch from n illicit narcotics to methadone and uh, behave in a totally reliable, law-abiding way. They do have a certain amount of superego. They do have a sense of commitment to other people, a sense of honesty, in spite of the many myths to the contrary. Now, I don't want you to feel that uh, you can only cure a drug addict in, in a therapeutic community because Daytop uh, has an outpatient setting in these storefronts, which we call SPAN, where we take what we call the soft core addict, who's been uh, used to heroin less than a year. And in my own private practice, I've taken the middle class addict who might have had heroin for many years, but has something going for them, like a job or a family, and we've been able to cure them uh, on an outpatient setting. Uh, and I use the cure, word cure as it is used medically, so that the underlying problems are no longer existent, which give rise to the symptoms. And uh, although uh, uh, it is conceivable that uh, once you cure a person of pneumonia, five years later you can get pneumonia again, uh, I think it's also conceivable that once we cure a drug addict, the social realistic stresses that confront all of us might reproduce uh, uh, a, re a reversion to his primitive earlier symptom. Because although we can cure him of his symptom, we don't remove the memory. You know, you never forget your past. You don't have to act on it. Uh, but I think that the, in the light of the program and the rehabilitation process at Daytop to settle for anything less than a total psychodynamic personality change is in today anachronistic to the best of what medicine can offer. Well, I, I still submit that th there are two issues. One is a social issue and one is a theoretical medical issue. And the social issue requires that we look at what is the capacity of the thing we call a therapeutic community, to get into treatment the large numbers of heroin users, as opposed to the feasibility of establishing a large-scale methadone treatment program. 
Now, you might argue that uh, you would accept that program so long as people did not uh, uh, support the idea that this was a permanent kind of thing. Yes. But I would submit the idea that for those people who are functioning on methadone, and as long as they are functioning in a socially acceptable way, I would be rather reluctant to see them forced arbitrarily to stop using methadone to undergo what we are calling this cure, uh, but would reserve that for those people who elect uh, to do so or who are not functioning adequately while on methadone. You know, I, I also, there's one other point. You keep referring to kids, you know, these young people. And it's very interesting that this must be the case in New York, and it must indicate that the problems are different in different communities. The average age of people seeking treatment in Chicago is 35 years, and that they've been on heroin for an average of 14 to 15 years. Now, it may very well be the reason that we are not seeing people uh, seeking out or accepting treatment in the therapeutic community as readily as you do is because we are seeing a different spectrum of the narcotics-using population, and that, therefore, methadone is for us something uh, different than it is for you. Well, I think if a person's used heroin for 14 or 15 years, his, his uh, whole personality has been so uh, frozen that he really feels there's no other way except perhaps to use uh, uh, methadone instead of heroin. Uh, but I question seriously the difference between uh, when you say a person is functioning on methadone. Is he functioning on a borderline peripheral rate, like he's an attendant in a gas station, or I shouldn't even say that, like he's a, a, a make type of job, you know, just one level above uh, welfare? Or is he really doing something significant? And what percentage are really capable of doing something significant while on methadone? I don't know that answer. Well, I think this is a matter to be looked at uh, when the data is in. Uh, when uh, we are looking at this, we are categorizing jobs and the earnings, and we're comparing this to the output, uh, the kinds of jobs held by people who pass through our own therapeutic community. And that when we have all this information, we might be able to answer the questions a little bit more objectively. Well, we've presented two sides of the problem and two varying approaches to the problem of the treatment of narcotics addiction. Obviously, there is much more to be done before all the answers to in as to what part each one of these may play in the total narcotics addiction problem. We thank Dr. Jerome Jaffe, Dr. Daniel Casriel, and Dr. Francis Gearing for their interesting analysis of a critical problem in patient care. In subsequent programs, we shall continue to record equally significant concepts and controversies in modern medicine. The opinions expressed on this program do not necessarily constitute endorsement by the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, the Public Health Service, or its constituents.